What's the story, Morning Glory? What's the word, Hummingbird? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and for joining me for this review of The Real Housewives of Atlanta, Season 14, Episode 9. Let's start with Kenya. Sonia comes over to Kenya's house and Candy calls and they all face, they're all three FaceTiming and Ke Candy was basically giving them an update about the trespasser on her property. So this guy um, ends up on her property. He says that Candy sent him. Um, he was clearly not right in his mind. I don't know if it was some substance issues or some mental issues, but he wasn't right in his mind. And the police ended up giving him, I think it was a warning. So after all of that, Kenya and Sonia are having a conversation about the confrontation between Kenya and Marlo at Drew's Drop It With Drew event. And... Kenya is basically like, I don't know why she's acting this way with me because I was not lying about being sick when I couldn't make it to the shindig that she threw for Sheree. I really was sick, but she was accusing me of lying. And then, you know, they have that big old blowout um, confrontation. And so Kenya is like, you know what? I've learned my lesson. You know, you keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. You're going to, you know, that's the definition of insanity. So I'm going to do things a little bit different. And I'm just going to forget about Marlo. I don't have time anymore. So Kenya is is done with Marlo. Moving on from there, let's get into Drew. Okay, so Miss Drew. Drew is very, very, I believe, I think that Drew is very, very, very pretty. Um, and it's just so sad that she just has this, this warped sense of reality. I don't know what to call it. It's really, really sad that she just doesn't have it together. So Drew is at the salon with her mother and she tells her mother that Ralph is writing a book about being a step parent and blended families. And then Drew says, I'm not exactly sure why he's writing a book about this because we haven't resolved our issues. But the issue of him being a step parent is resolved. He's a step parent to your children and he's writing a book about his experience. Um, I'm not exactly sure what issues there are to resolve about the family dynamic. Now, there's a lot of issues that still need to be resolved about your marriage to Ralph. But as far as, you know, when she said, I'm not sure why he's writing a book about this because we haven't resolved our issues. Uh, like he's a step parent. There's nothing left to resolve about that. Then they start talking about how there was this plan for Ralph to adopt Drew's son, Josiah. And they were wondering, Drew and her mother, where they were like, you know, I'm not sure exactly what halted that, why he hasn't, you know, done that yet. Drew, you don't know why your own husband has not adopted your son yet. This is a conversation that y'all have had never. I don't understand how you don't know. So if you don't even know why your husband has not adopted your son yet, is it because, oh, she did say that um, he didn't want to, Ralph didn't want to interfere with the relationship between Josiah and his biological father. And then Drew says, but he hasn't seen his biological father in forever. So um, my understanding is when it comes to adopting a child, both parents have to give consent, um, have to approve of this child being adopted by this, by this man. So the father, the biological father has to be a part of the process. If he's on the birth certificate, the biological father has to be a part of the adoption process as far as um, signing away his rights to Ralph. And if he just can't be found, then he they need to make sure that they follow the requirement to do the adoption without his consent if there are certain requirements that have to be met. You know, if they can prove that he's abandoned the child, and I think abandonment, um, you have to wait so many years to um, file a claim for abandonment. So... I feel like Ralph probably is not comfortable adopting Josiah because he probably gets the feeling that maybe the father would not really, the biological father would not approve of giving up his rights yet to his son. Maybe the father in his mind, he thinks that there's still a chance for him to reconnect with his son. And maybe that's why Ralph hasn't felt very comfortable going through with the adoption. Um, but for that, I think Ralph definitely would have adopted Josiah. I mean, him and Josiah share a room. You know what I mean? You can't get any closer than that. So then they start talking about, um, she tells her mom about um, 
the assistant, the assistant that Ralph had. Um, she said that the assistant had a lot of resentment towards her because she felt disrespected by the assistant. And so um, it was the assistant, I think, that had the idea about the book that gave Ralph the idea about the book. I don't remember what she said about the assistant in the book, but she was talking about, you know, he had this assistant and he had to get rid of her because I thought she was being very disrespectful. And the assistant ended up resenting Drew because Drew felt disrespected by the assistant. Drew's world is so topsy-turvy, crazy, upside down, inside out. It's hard to figure out what's going on. It's almost, her world is like, you have three different jigsaw puzzles, right? Three separate individual jigsaw puzzles, but then somebody just takes all three of them and jumbles them all up and tells you, okay, now you're going to figure out how to fix the puzzles for each, for each one of them. That's how complicated and crazy her life is. Most of the time, Drew's life makes no sense to me. I don't know what's going on. I mean, are you having issues with your husband or are you not? What exactly are the issues that you're having with your husband? There's like no clear definition of what's going on. How are you making your money? What does your husband do for a living? What the hell is drop it with Drew? Is it your company or someone else's company? So many questions about Drew's life. So then the mother says that she was talking to a prophet and um, the prophet left a message, I think, on her mother's phone. So the mother plays the message for Drew. And in this message, the prophet says that there is an adversary around Drew and it's either a female or someone with a female spirit. And this is every single person that's around Drew. It's like, okay, prophet, thank you for narrowing it down. That's everybody that she hangs out with. It's either a female or someone with a female spirit. Oh, it could have been her husband. You know, the adversary could have been, could very well have been her husband. So maybe the prophet is on to something. So Drew speculates that it's Sonia. And I'm thinking to myself, girl, your own assistant, and I'm sorry, y'all, but I forgot his name, the assistant that works for Drew, but used to work with Sheree and said Sheree owed him money. Your assistant is going around spreading a rumor about your husband, which you claim is false. He's trying to, he's tarnishing, like he is going out there saying things about your husband that are not true, but your issue is Sonia. Your issue, because Sonia questioned your fly by night business. Your issue with Sonya though. You think that it's Sonya. Out of all the people that are having an issue with you, you think that it's Sonya. Okay, fine. So moving on from there, let's get into Marlo. Marlo, 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 Marlo. So Marlo is um with her nephews and she says that ever since they spoke with their mother her nephews have been acting up they've been having some major behavioral issues their behavior has completely shifted which is completely understandable because the conversation that they had with their mother was you know borderline traumatic you know to see your mother not in her right mind and not willing to get the help I'm pretty sure that devastated and traumatized these two boys so of course they're acting out and so she's having a conversation with them and she's telling them you know y'all have really strayed off course as far as your behavior and we need to get back on course and so i just need to make sure that y'all understand what y'all need to do um to kind of correct your behavior uh marlo says that she's been getting calls from the school of them disrespecting the teacher uh, just a lot of stuff has been happening with the boys. And so the boys promise her that they're going to do better. And we think that hopefully things can get back on track, but they're going through a very, very, very tough time. And she asked them, do you think y'all might need some counseling? And they said, no, but I don't think that's an option for them. I think that you should just take them to get the counsel, to get counseling, have the counselor come to the house or something. But these boys are crying out for help. And Marlo, clearly you're not equipped. You you need to have them see a professional um someone there wasn't there um and if, and if they're if they're really turned off by the whole counselor thing then um your assistant who's like a father figure to them he needs to come and have a conversation with them like several times not just one conversation he needs to come and see them but if he's not a qualified professional uh marlo you need to consider having a professional speak with the boys because what they're going through is very very difficult it's very sad you, they have to talk to a professional and I don't think you should give them an option because they don't know any better. So you need to have someone come over and speak with them, preferably if it's someone that they can relate to someone who is like a big brother to them or like a father figure to them, like um, an African American male um, counselor. I think that would be, that would do wonders for these boys. So yeah, Marla, don't, don't give them the option. Just do it. 
Marlo then meets up with Sheree and Sonia at the furniture store because she's building this mansion and she needs to furnish it because what these housewives love to do and these reality TV stars, they like to buy these gigantic homes and they're barely furnished. So it's just like echoes upon echoes upon echoes in the house. So she's meeting up with them and she's also, you know, placing orders uh, to furnish her home. And she sits down with Sonia and Sheree and she tells them that she kicked the boys out. And of course, this was very shocking to them. It was very shocking to me. And she said that she had reached her breaking point with the boys. Um, she shows them video of how they're like not, they're not following her orders. They're just, you know, major disciplinary problems. One of the boys punched a hole in the wall. They don't clean up after themselves. Um, something about wet clothes that were left on the floor for days. Also, she had taken away, I think, their laptops or something, their their devices. They went into her room and got them back and were hiding them in their room. So she's having some major issues with them. And she said that she kicked them out. Now, I would have preferred that she used another term other than I kicked them out because that sounds harsh. It sounds like she just threw them out of her home and they just ended up on the streets. Uh, she could have just said, you know, I had a conversation with my sister. Things were not working out with the boys and we needed a break from each other before it got worse. And so my sister agreed to take them. But then for you to start off with, I kicked them out. It's like you you you, you look like a, like a horrible person for saying that. So she says that she can't take it anymore. She didn't know what else to do. So her sister, she took the boys to her sister's house. But her sister already has four children of her own. And now she's going to take on the two nephews. So, um, she says this is only for 30 days. She needed a 30 day break. And I think when the problems are this deep, a 30 day break, isn't gonna, it's not going to make things better. I think it can make things worse because they may, 30 days is a long time. And I think for children, it's even longer. Um, 30 days might be, they might become acclimated in that home with how things are done in that home. And hopefully things that are done in that home are, are right. Because when you get them back in 30 days, you're going to have to try to change it. Because even with parents who share custody of their children, we'll talk about like when the child goes to the other parent's house for a weekend, for a week, they come back different. And you're talking about 30 days with children who have behavioral problems, who are going through a very emotional um, moment right now with their mother them being gone for 30 days, they're going to come. It's so possible for them to come back as completely different people. And then you're going to have to get them readjusted all over again to your lifestyle, your schedule and your way of doing things. So she thinks, I don't know what Marlo thinks is going to happen in 30 days. That they're going to go away and then come back as these perfect children. I don't know what she thinks is going to happen in 30 days. And the whole time that they're with the other aunt, they're probably going to be thinking, you know, our aunt Marlo didn't want us. Our mother doesn't want us. Aunt Marlo doesn't want us. Our father doesn't want us. You know, it could be kind of traumatic for them. Um, so I was disappointed in Marlo that she did that. Because if you're going to take on the responsibility of a child, I don't think you can get a break. I don't think there's, they did not think that they were with you like as a trial run. They probably thought that this was going to be their new home until their mother gets better. So for you to relocate them to your sister's house, I just didn't think it was a good idea. Not at all. I don't think it's going to be beneficial. I think it's just going to end it backfiring on her. So that was very, very sad. Moving on from there, let's get into the woman of the hour, Sheree. Sheree Whitfield, come on up. So Sheree Whitfield, she, it starts off with her going to her daughter's podcast. She's a guest on her daughter's podcast show. I forget the name of it. So while they're doing the podcast, her daughter, Tiara, gets a notification on her phone, breaking news that, Tia, that um, Sheree and Tyrone are not speaking. And I'm thinking to myself, why is this breaking news? What the hell notification is this? It just seems very planted. It seems very staged that while she's on this podcast with Sheree, she gets a notification about Sheree and Tyrone that they're not speaking. And so she asks her mother, have you heard this? And the mom said, no, she hadn't heard this. And the mom says that um, her and Tyrone have not spoken and the mother says that uh, now she calls Tyrone broke and a scammer. And 
I'm thinking to myself, but Sheree, what does that say about you? That you were dating a scammer, a broke scammer for 10 years who was in prison. What does that say about you? So, because he was probably broke and scamming when he went to prison. Maybe that's why he was in prison. Um, you still dated him. So when you're dating him, oh, he's, you know, now that he's been released, when you're dating him, oh, he's reformed. He's learned his ways. Everybody deserves a second chance. You know, you just can't write off people just because they spent time in prison. But then when he ghosts you and leaves you stranded in Philadelphia, all of a sudden now he's broke. He's a scammer. He's this, he's that. But baby, he was your broke scammer. He belonged to you, girl. So moving on from there. So then Sheree has her friend Fatum come over and uh, they start talking about Tyrone. Now, what absolutely tickled me was the show that Sheree put on when she talked about Tyrone as if. <sighs> so Sheree was Tyrone's ride or die. You know, she was going to be there until the wheels fell off for him. Um, all this and that. And then she says how he broke her heart. He, she feels uh, like she was duped by him. She feels stupid for believing in him. She feels embarrassed for how he's treated her. And then she starts this cry, this absolutely artificial fake cry. And I'm like, Sheree, this is so awful. Even for you, this is bad. This is some horrible acting. So she starts crying and it's one of those really fake, loud cries. And she immediately like, I, I felt like right before she covered her face with the hanker, with the um, tissue, she kind of looked at the camera to make sure that they were looking at her. And then she covers her face and she turns her head away and she does this very dramatic, loud cry. And then her and Fatum have to go to a whole nother room for her to get herself together. The whole entire time her back is to the camera because she's not crying. We know she doesn't have any tears in her eyes and she doesn't want us to see that. It was so awful. Sheree, what are you doing to us, girl? It was entertaining because we know how fake it was. But girl, it was bad. So... When she sits back down at the counter, you know, and she's gotten herself together... Her eyes don't look red, swollen, wet, damp. Her makeup is not smudged anywhere. Um, her face isn't red at all. Her tissue is pristine and white. Girl, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> it was just so bad. So just as bad as that crying was, just as awful as it was, all of a sudden she just snapped out of it because she wasn't really crying. She just snapped out of it. And she's like, you know what? But I'm better now and I'm going to just, you know, concentrate on my, on my business, on my she by Sheree. I'm just going to put all of my energy into my business. Anyways, moving on from that. So then Sheree, um, Sheree's uh, hosting a slumber party at her house and she invites all the girls there. The theme of the slumber party is stripping away the negativity and bearing it all. And the activity that they're going to be doing is they're going to be uh, painting some nude models. So a male and a female model come out and, you know, they're going to be painting them nude. So between the nude models and the very explicit drawings, I was like, bravo, this is just way too much. This is way too damn much. I mean, this is cable, but it's not premium cable. And I'm just hoping that people don't watch this show with their children because I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe what they're, especially with the drawings. Now the drawings were a lot worse than the nude models because those drawings, it was just, I mean, look, there was some stuff that was, stuff that was added that I felt like was so, why are we doing this? What is up with the droplets? What is going on? Okay, so before Drew shows up, um, they talk about Drew. So Fatum, she was talking about how, you know, at the dinner at um not at the dinner at the at Kenya's daughter's tea party, uh, Drew kind of you know she kind of turned on Fatum because Fatum was trying to make it clear to Drew that she understood. Hey, your assistant is saying that your husband is gay. 
Um, do you not understand that your own assistant, this person that you're paying that works for you is saying that your husband is gay because when it was said to her, it was like it went over her head. Like she didn't, either didn't hear or didn't understand. So Fatum was trying to clarify things for her. And then Drew turned on her and she was like, just be quiet, be quiet. Just shut up, shut up. Don't talk to me. You know, she kind of like went hard on Fatum. So Fatum felt some kind of way about that. And she was like, you know what? Let me do some digging of my own. Let me see what's really going on with Drew and Ralph. So she hired a private investigator and the private investigator dug up all this information on Ralph and Drew but the most interesting thing was that they used aliases that's all that the private investigator could come up with that they used aliases like what that's it so um Candy said in her confessional she says Ralph is like Tommy from Martin he has money clearly, but does he have a job? Like, what does he do for a living? You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no job in sight. Um, that's still not clear. Like I said, Drew's life, it's like you, you can't figure out what's going on. You don't know what the hell is going on with her life because it's just a lot of confusion. So then soon after that, Drew arrives. Um, Drew and Sheree end up having the same pajamas. And um, then Marlo arrives. And then when Marlo showed up, Kenya says in her confessional, uh, Sasquatch with the lace front showed up. So they start the painting of the nude models and all of that. So then Drew and Sonia, they're sitting next to each other while they're painting. And Drew brings up the issue of Sonia questioning whether or not Drew and Ralph are really that busy or are, are they really that booked and busy but can still be able to take care of their kids because this all stemmed from the previous episode when Sonia approached Ralph like why she's talking to Ralph about whether or not she should have another baby is beyond me but she especially when she doesn't even like his wife for whatever reason Sonia approached Ralph and she was like, you know, me and my husband. Oh, the reason why was because Ralph and her husband, Ralph and Ross are friends. But then wouldn't that mean that Ross would have approached Ralph to talk about, you know, whether or not they should have another baby. But anyway, it was Sonia. So she had approached Ralph and she's like, oh, me, you know, Ross wants to have another baby, but I'm just so booked and busy. I don't have time to raise another child, blah, blah, blah. And then Ralph had said, well, we have three kids. You only have one. We have three kids and we're extremely busy and we're able to handle it. So don't let that uh, be the basis of your decision, like how busy you are. If you want to have a kid, have a kid, but don't be like, oh, we're too busy to have a kid because you can make it work. That's what I got from Ralph. But somehow or another, Drew tells Sonia at this uh, pajama party, she tells Sonia, well, it came back to me from Ralph that you questioned how busy we were. Like you didn't believe him when he said that we were very busy people. And then Sonia was like, that's not the conversation that we had. It didn't go like that. So Sonia tries to explain herself and she accidentally referred to Ralph as Drew. And then Drew goes, Oh, are you talking about Ralph? Or are you talking about me? And then Sonia said, girl, your, your name is, you got these female masculine names. I don't, I get them mixed up all the time. And so they start bickering. And then Sonia was like, I don't have time for this. And so Sonia gets up and she leaves. And I'm like, Drew, why are you bringing up this asinine conversation with Sonia? Especially when I thought that the two of them had somewhat made up. Now here comes Drew with the stupidity about, well, my husband told me that you question your husband didn't tell you that. If he told you that he misunderstood, but one thing's for sure and two things for certain, you and Ralph have some serious communication issues. So Drew, I don't even think you understood what your husband was telling you when he was telling you about this conversation. I don't think you understood what Ralph told you. And I don't think Ralph told you, you know, Sonia was questioning how busy we were. I don't think it went down like that, Drew. I think you misunderstood your husband. Like everything else about your life and your marriage. It's just one big, huge misunderstanding, miscommunication. Okay, so Sonia walks away from that. Moving on, Marlo and Candy are having a conversation about Marlo's nephews. And Marlo tells Candy, look, I had to let the boys go. They were, I had to take them to my sister's house because, you know, I was just, I was at my breaking point. I couldn't take it anymore. And so Candy was like literally shocked to hear this. And so um, Marlo says that she was drinking more, crying more. She was depressed. You know, she just really wasn't herself, you know, struggling with these two boys. And Candy just didn't understand how Marlo could do that. And Marlo said that she needed to save herself. And then Candy was like, well, how can you take them from 
your lifestyle and now they're going to a completely different lifestyle. I mean, that's kind of jarring and shocking for kids, you know, to come from practically the, the, the lap of luxury and then to go to just a completely different lifestyle. I don't know what the sister's lifestyle is. Um, the sister might be, I have no idea. So, but it's, it's different from Marlo for sure. So Marlo just doesn't understand, you know, she doesn't get it. And I thought Candy was really trying to say, when you take on the responsibility of being a parent, there's no time off. There's no break. Okay. It's a 24 seven thing. And you just have to put your feelings to the side and you just have to make it work for them. And you need to just fix yourself so that you can be there for them. The solution is not to put them in someone else's home and make them someone else's responsibility. But, you know, Marlo, I mean, at first I was like, oh my God, Marlo is so selfless. You know, she's so giving. She wants to make a better life for her nephews. And, you know, the how she grew up in the foster care system is fueling her motivation to really be there for her nephews and make a good life for them. But it wasn't, it, it's not like that. You know, she ended up, you know, being typical Marlo, just thinking about herself. So after that, they all sit down for dinner. Oh, Lisa Wu shows up as well. They all sit down for dinner and, uh, Kenya wants to play a game called Yes, Queen. So everybody goes around the table. They say something very positive. And when they say their positive statement, everybody yells out, Yes, Queen. So Candy starts off um, and she says that her and Marlo patch things up. So they're back on track with her friendship. So that was good and positive. Marlo says that she loves everyone at the table. That was good and positive. Then it came to, Drew, to Drew's turn. And Drew says, well, I get along with almost everyone here. And Everybody just was like, what? No, ma'am. This is a positivity exercise, a positivity game. For you to say, I get along with almost everyone here. You're throwing shade. You're being shady. And that is not what this is about. So they're like, okay, Drew, you know what? We'll come back to you, girl. We're going to give you time to think about it. And then we're going to come back and hopefully you'll have something better to say. So when they get back to her, she says the same exact thing. Well, for the most part, I like everybody here. And it was like, no, Drew, like, what the hell is your problem? Drew really has it in for Sonya, and I don't understand why. Because your own assistant is the one that's doing the most, but you have it in for Sonya. So Kenya, like, puts those Kenya eyes on her, and she's like, no, Drew, try again. Start over. So then Drew questions, well, Marlo, do you really, truly love everybody at this table? Or are you just saying that? And so Marlo was like, well, I love everybody. I love everybody in God's way. Okay, we know what that means. So then Lisa Wu steps in and she starts talking. Lisa Wu was drunk. Okay, she was gone. Lisa Wu steps in and she says, you know, we need to uh, forgive and let go of the anger and um forgive let go of the anger and don't be waiting for other people to apologize you know you need to just forgive and move on and so while Lisa Wu is talking Sonia cuts her off and starts talking Lisa Wu got really upset but Lisa Wu was drunk Lisa Wu got really upset at Sonia and she's like shut the hell up I'm still talking so they start going at it and then Sonia was like you know let me just speak what I gotta say and then you can you know take the rain again and Lisa was like no just shut up and let me finish my thought and I was like wow Lisa Wu you made a comeback for real so Kenya <laughs> amongst this huge argument Kenya is shouting for more champagne cuz you know Kenya is lit. So then Drew and Fatum go at it. So then Drew says, "Well, I don't understand why you're coming after me and my husband, you know, why you're speaking on my husband." And uh Fatum then Kenya reveals that, well, you know, Fatum did some digging. She got a private investigator and, you know, they investigated, they, they did a background check on you and your husband. And it came out that you and your husband are using a whole bunch of aliases. <laughs> How does Kenya get away with this? How does Kenya, I mean, she is constantly revealing secret conver private conversations, things that were said to her in confidence. And yes, all of this is on camera and it's going to be seen anyway, but how does she get away with this? I love Kenya. So they talk about this information that Fatum's private investigator found. And uh, they're asking her, they're asking Drew, like, why does your husband Ralph use the alias Danielle? And Drew says he doesn't use an alias Danielle. Danielle is a real person. She's our assistant. Well, girl, then Ralph is using your assistant's um, <laughs> identifying information. 
to do something, to get something because he's walking around acting like he's Danielle, but Danielle is a real person. So he must be using Danielle's personal identifying information. So Ralph, please don't let me hear about you scamming people. Don't join that elite group of Jen Shaw and Tom and Erica uh, Girardi. Don't let me hear about you scamming people, Ralph. And that's how you're getting this money. Okay. So after that, Fatum wants to do this cleansing um, exercise with Sheree. Um, it's an incense and you cleanse your female, what you, the female parts incense. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So after that, they do the whole cleansing exercise. Everybody's drunk. Everybody's having a great time. It looked like a fun party. It looked like a fun party. Sheree threw a fun party. So after all of that, <laughs> uh, they all were standing up. I think uh, Kenya wanted to give a toast to Sheree. And then Kenya said something about her wig. I don't know if she said she wanted to take it off. I don't know. And then uh, Marlo was like, well, I'm glad that you're finally admitting that you wear wigs, Kenya. And Marlo, Kenya was like, don't come for me. And she's like, I'm not coming for you. I'm giving you a compliment. You're finally confident enough. You're confident in yourself enough to talk about uh, that you also wear wigs. And then Marlo I mean, Kenya still drunk. She's still out there. And she was like, I am the moment. I am the moment. And then Marlo says, well, not to Mark. You're not the moment to Mark. Once again, Marlo has to hit below the belt and bring up something very, very personal where nobody's talking about anybody's personal business. Why Marlo? Like when Marlo once, but then again, you know, she had a really tough upbringing, a really tough childhood. So I guess she can't turn off that tough persona. After that, Marlo invites everybody on a road trip to Blue Ridge Mountain, and that's where the episode ended. That was a very good episode. That party was everything. That party to me was everything. Drew, girl, do not let me hear about you and Ralph stealing people's social security numbers, stealing people's identities, um, doing some scandalous, nefarious things out there with people's information. Girl, do not let that be the case. But... I don't know. I'm not going to say no more. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. On your way out, please don't forget to rate the video. If you like this content, please subscribe and I'll definitely talk to you later. Bye.